John of Damascus controversies regarding his life and work. Introduction Who was John of Damascus and why is he significant? As a Christian theologian serving in a newly formed Arab empire, John stood between two worlds in conflict. His writings and insight into early Islam may have influenced the Christian apologetic approach with Islam for the next 300 years. His early testimony from an informed observer's viewpoint of the development of Islamic theology may assist the scholarly task of reconstructing the various political debates and responses to Christian Muslim polemics. In addition, his writings indicate that he knew about Muhammad and the scriptures of the Ismailites. These early reflections from a theologian's perspective provide documented evidence of the few of the few Christians held in regard to Muhammad and the Quran. His treatise may, may also help us construct a timeline of events and ideas as they develop in the first 100 years of Islam. The city of Damascus, when John grew up, was a Christian city conquered by the Arabs in AD 635. Many thought that the murdering Arabs were a punishment from God from their unfaithfulness. In AD 661, it became the center of the Umayyad Empire when John later served in a high position under the Caliphs as he as did as did his father and grandfather before him. From his view was a contemporary witness, together with his later years of studying and writing, studying and writing theological treatises, John was able to speak uniquely on the earliest controversies between Christian and Islam. In regard to John's situation, J.W. Sweetman states that states perhaps no individual Christian thinker is so important in the comparative study of Islam and Christian theology as John of Damascus. Of his influence on both the Christian and Islamic communities of his time, Daniel Sahas writes, John of Damascus sought writings on Islam have indeed a very long history as well as a profound influence upon other Christian Christian writers who dealt with or wrote who dealt with or wrote about Islam. His exposition of Islam made Islam known to the Christian community and therefore made interfere in dialogue part of the history and the development of Islam as well as of Christianity. John of Damascus then was a Christian theologian in dialogue with Islam. His first and testimony should provide an important historical link to the early development of Islam within a large, larger Christian community. Unfortunately, while his written works are well known, the biographical material that could help us contextualize this history, historical details is at a minimum. The biographies of John of Damascus are thought to be very late to 100 until 300 years after his death and of dubious quality. Florowski says that it is not easy to pick out what is authentic and, dispu and is in indisputable. And Hoyland adds that the, in the information that would help us to, f to form a proper assessment of his writings is either lacking or of doubtful veracity. Andrew Luth emphasizes that the hagiographical lives of John the survived are not unreliable. His writings contain scarcely any personal clues and references to him in other historical sources are sparse. Father Martin Juggy, in his statement about what is factually about John, summarizes that. St. John is a descendant of distinguished Christian family of Damascus, of, Dama, of Damascus in Syria. He was a priest and monk at the Laura of St. Sabas near Jerusalem. He became a prominent figure in the iconoclastic controversy. As a preacher, he enjoyed a far-reaching far reputation 
and has and has left us to make scholarly works which witness to his encyclopedic erudition. All other data must rest on conjectures. Actually, though there are a number of other biographical pieces of information that can be put together to form a variable, verifiable feature of this important Christian in the court of the Caliph, one thing that a number of the early biographies did not did not do was to sort out what was worked to and what and what was probably a pokey wall. This work will attempt to categorize the life of John along the following three divisions. One substantiated historical evidence. Two logical conclusions based on writings from the from that time. Internal evidence, external evidence. Hopefully, then, they will be able to piece the information together so that we have a more integrated picture of his birth, death, and education, his involvement in the Caliphate, his knowledge of Islam and the Quran, and finally his writings, especially in relation, in relation to the development of Islam and the Quran. First, we will determine that what we can say of actually about, about John of Damascus from historical source, as well as his own writings, see Appendix A. The traditional accounts, the, the traditional accounts, especially information from the Vita on, jo on John of Damascus, will then help flesh out some of the details so that, together with the most substantiated material, we may connect more of the pitches of the past and get a clear picture of his life, work, and influence. Substantiated historical evidence, but and that the year of John of the the year of John's birth is very important because it is tied to who he may have known and what he may have witnessed. Most scholar places place John's birth in either. 600, 674 or 675, but suggest that his birth may have been as, as early as 652, allowing for a friendship with Yazid I, who was born in 400, 644 and served as the Caliph between 600, 680 until, until 683. However, this seems to be based out to be based on a statement by Lamens which claimed that a young son of Sergius named John was a friend of the Caliph Yazid 680, 680 83, when, the, when an Arabic source states only what is the Caliph's treatment Sir John and the, the Christian who who was present, meaning the father of John. If Robert Hoyland is correct in his assessment that it is John's father who was a friend of, Cali of the Caliph Yazid, of the friend of the Caliph Yazid the first around 680, when John would have been only about five years old, then the year. 675 for John's birth is still the best always on par with any earlier dates. The traditional date of his death is December 4, 749, and Sars adds that there is no compelling reason to dispute this date. The terminus pause the, the terminus post crime for John's death will be 743 when he supposedly dedicated his theological masterpiece, the video of Toroxa, to his friend, to his friend Cosmas Melodus, a fellow monk and a friend of John from, from the monastery of St. Sabas, who was installed as the Bishop of Mayuma in 743. There is a possible problem with this date, however, from Highland's perspective. In that, in that dedication, in the dedication date, was not part of the text, but rather part of secondary addition in the in the lemma and the later copy of the document from an 11th century Georgian translation did not have 
the dead attached at all. Nonetheless, further research reveals that it can be said with a degree of certainty that John and Cosmas were fellow monks or fellow monks in his in France. That John composed his word of knowledge at the, at the request of Cosmas when this letter had become Bishop of Mayuma, and the earliest that this could have been accomplished was in 743 when Cosmas was installed. When therefore John had to still alive in AD 743, on the other side, the Terminus ante of 754, for John's death has been assumed based on his anathematization by the sign of Hiraya, is of Chalcedon, and is in the, in the same year. Though the general consensus seems to be that this Mark John's death, that is Mark John's death, we we cannot sum summarize that we he must have he must have been dead before seven hundred forty seven hundred fifty four when he was anathematized in the past test by iconoclastic church council because as Hoyland points out the word the word Catilian ca Catilian may simply means may simply mean the post of the degraded or not necessary dead thus. John may have been living through the time, as some have speculated, for some, for, for some put his age at the death, at death over 100 years. Still, Andrew Lute concludes that the construction of the phrase suggested that John, as well as the other two who were, who were an anathematist, were, were all dead by 754. The, the specific year 749 or 750 for John's death primarily comes from the deduction of several researchers such as Felix, Felhi and Church, who note that the early 19th century biography of St. Stephen the Sabbath states that Stephen was the nephew of John and came to the monastery when John was living in the year 735 when his father Theodore the brother of John was exiled. According to the biography, he stayed for 15 years and left in the year 749 or 750, apparently because of the death of his uncle. This would put John's death specifically in 749 or 750. However, Hoyland believes that failure and other and others have wrongly assumed that Stan Stephen is Sabbath referred to, this, to Stephen Ibn Mansur Ali Maski, who was the son of Theodore, who was the son of Theodore and the nephew of John of Damascus. Sahas also cautions that also Sahas also cautions us that Stephen's death does not necessarily warrant John's death at the time that he acknowledges some of the of the same doubts that Hoyland was that Hoyland has. However, Sars points out that Leon used the biography of Stephen and the and the one who ties Stephen together with John Mark no, Mark makes no reference to John after the departure of Stephen in the year in the year seven hundred forty nine seven hundred fifty that giving that thus giving a credible end to John's life. He ultimately through the supporting details of John's death as well as for his as well as for his birth as suspect. Even Sahas has concluded after carefully weighing the historical information that there is no compelling reason to reject the year of John's death as 749 or 750. Also, the death of 675 for his birth is still the best validated year according to the sources that we have. Thus, John's life would have spent uh, would have spent a total of a total of about 75 years between 675 until 750 and would have included familiarity with the following Umayyad caliphs Muawiyah the first 661 80 Yazid 1 680 83 Muawiyah the second 683 Marwa the first Six Magwan the first six hundred eighty four Abdul Abel Malik eight hundred 
685 I'll wallet the first 705 15 and possibly tow up those the Sulaiman even Abdul Malik 715 17 Umar the second 717 20 Prominence of his family really prominence of his family's religious and public resources. John of Damascus' grandfather Mansur ibn Sarjun was the financial governor of Damascus when he when the Arabs researched the year in 635. After six months, he apparently capitulated to the Arab leader Khalid bin Khalid Abil B. Al Walid and surrendered the city after the after receiving favorable conditions of surrender. Later in the year 661, Mansur was promoted to the highest position in the Caliphate under Muawiyah I, 661-80. Apparently, he was the chief financial officer for the city, also known as the General Logotitis. Log Logotitis a position which implies the collection of land taxes which would have involved the local Christians since at the time the Arabs could not, could not hold land personally. This position seems to have been passed down to family lines for John's father, Sargun bin Mansuk of Sergius, inherited by the position and then passed it on, passed it on to John during the Caliphate of Abdul Ab al Malik Ab al Malik 685-705, who apparently was a good friend of John's father. It is also important to note that Sabas indicates that John may have attained a higher position than his father, that of personal secretary to the Caliph. True, he would have continued with the financial responsibilities that his father left to him. Sabas identifies the position as proto proto symbolon. Proto Symbolos or Head of Fisog, or as Philip Scaffs or as Philip Saffs suggests, Chief Counselor. Saff also states that the term is often interpret, interpreted as Fisher, but that office did not make ex, but that office did not exist. John's family was probably Semitic, and Mansur most like means victorious, though the one two other renderings are ransom or safe. John was known to the Arabs as, as Mansur ibn Sajun, which was the same as his grandfather's name, though in his later life it was Yuhanna bin Absur bin Sajun, Sahas, Luz, and Chase. All point out that all point out that John's surname is Arabic, but Lekos says that his family was with a dub of Syrian origin. Both aspects could be true. For if his family ancestry were, e were indeed Syrian, his father, his grandfather could have been given as an Arabic names when the uh, when the Arabs when the Arabs took over the government. Whatever the case, the Masuk family seems to have been respected by both the Christians and the Arabs alike, and they were known for their pity and attachment to the Orthodox faith. However, this weather did not remove the stain of history, even though two later members of the family, Sergius the First, 842-58, and Elias the Third, 878-907, became esteemed patriarchs of Jerusalem. The Mansur family name still carried with it the scar of that one member who had surrendered who had surrendered the city to the enemy. This resentment might have built up over time as the effects of the pact of Umar were felt more deeply. This pact of Umar is supposed to have been the stems of peace over to the Syrians when they were conquered by the Saracens in 635, though it could have been from a later time when Saracens had a greater hold over their empire. Some of the obligations imposed upon the Christians were that they, were that they had to pay a poll tax, also known as a Dimi tax of Jizya, which was not imposed upon Saracens. Upon Saracens, they could not build new churches or repair old ones if they were in Arab characters. 
they could not proselytize Muslim or convert anyone to their beliefs, though there was no prohibition against anyone who wanted to embrace the religion of the Saracens, and they had to show preventive treatment to the Saracens, such as standing in their presence and offering their seats when Saracens, when Saracens wished to sit. It's easy to see how this second-class citizen, citizenship could wear thin could work thin after a while and blame and blame could, could be channeled to be any to anyone involved in capitulation to such humiliating terms. To those outside of the Arab dominated world, John was known by his Christian name and place of origin, John of Damascus or John Damaskin. He was also known as a Presbyterian monk and of the greater, greatest writings of the of theology, poetry and hymns in the Eastern Orthodox Church, Theophanes seven hundred fifty eight and eight hundred seventeen. A Byzantine chronicle, chronicler referred to John of Damascus as the one who has well been called Chriso Chrysogoras because of the golden grace of the spirit that is reflected in his speech, especially T with Greek Wells and Post demonstrates that he had some type of classical education and people writing about John three centuries later were later were still a mess at the weight of his crafts of not, not of not only theological methods but also of math, science and philosophy philosophy. On the other hand, Andrew Lutz seems to believe that this should not have been so uncommon for a, for a young man growing up in a prosperous Christian family which had been totally influenced by the Hellenistic world which was so prevalent before the Arab invasion. Frederick just says that his understanding of classical Greek philosophy and science is amply demonstrated in his first portion of the font of knowledge which is known as the dialectica for it is for it not only for first the first example of a manual of philosophy especially composed as an aid to the study of theology but but it has remained to the present day indispensable for a proper understanding of Greek theology. Chase also concludes that John's writings are sufficient to show that his traditional reputation as an eloquent Alert and the food, the food preacher is fully justified. John probably succeeded his father as the chief financial officer of the Umayyad Empire during the reign of Abdul Malik, 875-705. Though the Arabic sources used by Holland state that John's father left office around AD 700. Allegedly, because the caliph imposed a rule that, a rule that only Arabic speakers could hold a high office, they do not mention that John served uh, under Ab, 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 -Malik, Ab al Malik and therefore cast sufficient suspicions on John's actual service under the caliph. This story, however, is one of the several anecdotal explanations of the policy change that took place in the first half of the 8th century when Greek was replaced by Arabic as the office, official language of the bureaucracy. There are two problems with trying to use this gradual movement with the idea that John's father was removed from office during the last part of Abdel Ab el Malik reign. The first problem is that it is very possible that the senior master knew New Arabic well, since he, has, he, has, he since he had functioned in a high position under the Arab rule for many years, and early sources have John's father conversing with the Caliph on several occasions. The other problem is that a number of sources suggest that Greek was still used in the bureaucracy of the Umayyad Empire until most of the positions were filled by Arabs which wasn't until almost the end of the rule in 750. If this is accurate, then it is unlike, unlikely that even Masyur John's father was pushed out 
of office which would have precluded his son from inheriting the position. Sahas also maintains that Christian sources as well as Muslim ones support the fact of John's service in the Caliphate. Sahas writes that John's father may have died between 691 and 695 since he is mentioned in the in the chronicle by Theophanes in relation to an event that took place in 691 and presuppose the death of empire uh, of emperor Justinian II which took place in 695 views as our marker Sahas death of 695 and Hoyland's death of 700 we can at least make a strong supposition that John's father died between the year 695 and 700, and John assumed his father's position toward the latter part, the latter part of Abd al Malik reign. The report of by the Seven Ecumenical Council of 787 also strongly confessed the view that John had a financial position in the Caliphate since they likened him to the Apostle Matthew who had been a tax collector between he followed Jesus. This, the report reads as follows. John, who is insultingly called Mansu by all, abandoned all emulating the evangelist Matthew and followed Christ, considering the same of Christ as a richness superior to the treasures which are in Arabia. He chose rather to suffer with the people of God than to enjoy the temporary place of sin. Though it may be difficult to give a precise beginning and ending that for John's role as an administrator in the Caliphate, there is really no reason to doubt that John served in the same office as his father and grandfather before him. Retirement from public office In time, John resigned from his post in the Umayyad government and retired to a monastery near Jerusalem, perhaps St. Sabas. Two questions that and two questions that enter in here are why did he leave his prominent position and when did this take place? In the early stages of the Arab takeover of Syria, the Arabs were more tolerant than even the Byzantine Emperor Heraclius, and they usually retained the existing administrative structure as well as the official Greek language. After all, the Arabs were not used to ruling the more sophisticated lands that they conquered, and they did not have enough educated followers to assume the, respons to assume the responsibilities needed to keep the government working smoothly. In time, however, the Arab rulers began to replace their Christian administrators with, their fe with, fellows, with fellow Arabs and demand that Arab be used instead of Greek. Theophanes records, however, that some things still require the use of Greek, some, so some Christians were still needed there in the government. And Drew Lutz believes that John probably resigned from his governmental post as early as 660 during the time of World the I when this changed over from the Greek to Arabic to was taking place. However, this should not have been a problem for John since Sahas states that there is good reason to believe that he knew Arabic. Raymond Lekos also, also supports this view when he argues that if John had not been well versed in Arabic, then he would not have retained his post in the reign of Al Walid 705-15 because of the Arabization that took place at the time. Thus, Lekos argues that John probably resigned his position in the Caliphate during the time of Umar II, who was particularly intolerant of having Christians in his administration. Agnes Simon concurs, concurs with this and adds that the Caliph Umar even refused them Christians the right to hold, to, to hold public office. John then made his way to the monastery at St. Sabas near Jerusalem when he did most if not all of his writing. Other, scholar, other scholars document his entry into the monastery as early as 715 at the end of Al-Walid's reign. Philip Saf even has John 
becoming a monk in the in the convent of Saint Sabas in the 730, perhaps because the time, because the first time Theophanes refers to John in his chronography, it's the year 730, and he places John, the son of Mansur, as a priest and monk in Syrian Damascus. The the most likely scenario is that he made the transition from Peles to Sir in time to become a priest and take up his pen against the Ecolodocus in 726. Yes, since Umar II was so intolerant of Christians serving in an administrative post, even if they were Arabic, it is likely that John remained through the reign of Walid the First and entered the monastic life around the 716. Monastery life and writings. It is assumed that John entered the monastery of Saint Sebastian near Jerusalem, since John mentioned being close to the patria of Jerusalem, presumably John the Fifth, John the Fifth, 706. 706-35 and often priest in the church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. However, John does not mention the monastery of St. Sabas in any of his writings and Holland maintains that John's absence from a list of luminaries who lived there during the 8th century mitigates against the St. Sabas as his place of residence. In fact, the earliest connection made between John and St. Sabas is in one of the 10th century letters composed by a letter John, Patria of Jerusalem, Patria of Jerusalem, John the John the the, the seventh, sixty four sixty six. However, this can be incomplete and this and designed for purposes other than what researchers are using them for. And most biographers still accept Saint Sabas as John's as John's residence. Even Hoyland accept that accept the possibility that the extra of the life of Saint John, the Eremopolite, Eremopolite gives gives credit give, gives credible witness to the fact that both Cosmos and John of Damascus were received were received into the monastery of Saint Sabas at the hands of the same abode named Nicodemus sometime at the 8th century. Also, Frederick Chase states that one may still see the cell of St. John of Damascus where he lived and wrote and also his burial site in, at St. Sabas. Recently, Mary, Mary Franz Ausepi has called into question this traditional view that John of Damascus had retired to the Great Laura at Mark Sabah, founded in 487, to live and to write. Her suppositions are derived mainly from her research or to works concerning the monastery in the 8th century, the Vita of Seven the Sabbath, written 725-94, written by Leontius of Damascus between 807 21 and the passion of the 27 martyrs. She her, her main argument rests on the premise that in the read of Stephen the Sabbath, Stephen does not mention John of Damascus in his list of important members living in the monastery during the 8th century. Her reasoning seems to be that if John of Damascus were such an important figure in such a rich and powerful establishment, that then his reputation would have written mentioned in the book reflecting on the great luminaries of the monastery. Yet, Yet the two texts are silent in regard of to John of Damascus. She goes on to infer that John was either a monk of at Maxaba or the two texts did not did not consider him to be much of importance. However, her conclusions rest solely on argument on an argument from silence. One reason Leontius may not have mentioned John of Damascus in Stephen's list of important sabbats is that the purpose of the hagiography may not have been so much to honor specific members of the monastery, but rather to promote Chalcedonian Christianity itself. As Sidney Griffith, 
I certainly agree with guys in relation to the life of Theodore of Edisa, the life heroes of the peace at the monastery of Marsaba, the sea of Jerusalem, with its holy places and the desert bombs, who are presented as the guarantors of Christian orthodoxy is the Islamic milieu. This may explain why Stephen the Sabbath's list of important luminaries who brought renown to the monastery were miracle workers and martyrs rather than scholars, though they, there were a number of important scholars preset at Marsaba in the 8th century. At one point in her, her argument, Auzebi writes that Stephen could not have been an admit, admirer of John because when Stephen promoted a role model of his disciples, he recommended that they strive to be light to prestigious monks who were known for their miracles rather than someone who got doctrine, liturgy and hymns like John. However, this may simply have revealed Stephen's preference for miracle workers, at least in the context of his own life as a miracle worker. If this is the case, then Auschwitz's argument from silence loses its significance. In another attempt to explain the possible silence regarding John's absence from the list, and Luke proposes that John of Damascus may have resided at another monastery situated near Jerusalem rather than at Mark Saba. He refers to a 10th century manuscript of John's first sermon on the Domitian that contains a phrase, Tis Peleas Lavras, on the Odlora, which refers to the monastery of St. Cariton founded 275 which is also located near, Je near Jerusalem. Is it possible that John lived and wrote in the different Chalcedonian monastery, which was known as pro for promoting Maximus the Confessor, whom John of Damascus seemed to emulate? However, there are several reasons why the old law of Cariton would not fit John's location as well as the great law of Marsaba, first of all, even though it is known that Chariton was a monastery where the most was produced a copies of manuscripts and translated works from Greek to Arabic, the monastery consisted mostly a series of seven caves where the monks live and work. It, it probably did not contain an extensive library as, as was Hus and Marsaba. For, for a such scholar near of for a such scholar as John of Damascus, it is likely he would have wanted to locate as near as possible to the best library available. As Nasrallah notes in his assessment of John's writings, they contain 738 citations bonded into 158 works by 48 different authors. This would have necessitated a well-stocked library which Cariton did not seem to have. In addition, Patrick notes that even in the time of Kirill of Skytopolis, circa 555, the library of the Great Laura was the largest and most developed of those in all the monasteries around Jerusalem. Also, as far as the heading of the Sermon on the Domitian containing a reference to the old Laura, it could simply indicate that John had written this particular sermon while visiting Cariton. He was known for preaching and teaching fellow Melkite monks, so it would not be unusual to find him doing some of his sermon preparation in another monastery. John of Damascus was first and foremost a scholar. He was not a miracle worker and he was a martyr. This may be the reason why he was not on Stephen's list of celebrities as a scholar. It seems more likely that he would have decided to live at Marsaba in order to have access to the great library in the area. Tradition has also strongly linked him to the Great Laura rather than Old Laura. In addition, he could have easily written and studied at modern monasteries such as Cariton while teaching, preaching, and researching. When 
even though he served in Jerusalem with the Church of Sepulchre, he, he was also raised with the Patriarch. These were all searches for more resources for his, for his search. Therefore, it makes more sense of evidence to place John's residence at Marsaba with travels to Jerusalem and beyond for purposes of preaching, teaching, and research. While we may not have direct evidence outside the 10th century video on John of Damascus that he ever lived at the monastery of St. Sabas, it is pretty certain that he was ordained as a priest and took the monastic name of John. Theophanes, who died in 818, called, calls John priest and monk in his, in his chronicle of the year 730, and Followowski states that his ordination must have been before 734, since even John alludes to his ordination at the hands of his mentor John V, who died on 735. Cheers on the on the other hand ascertains that it must have been by the year 726 probably because it is likely that John wrote his first letter against the iconoclast on 730, 726 and it carried the authority of the of a priest. Logical conclusions based on writings from that time internal and external evidence from John's writings include expands on some of the other aspects of John's life that can be ascertained from internal and external evidence from John's writings. For example, John was the milky tradition and therefore was a supporter of the orthodoxy of the Byzantine king which in Syrian is Malka. In the title of one of John's homilies, he is described as a presbyter priest of the Holy Resurrection of Christ our, our God, which may refer to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, which was also known as the Church of Anastasis Resurrection. In this context, F. Stratiadis even goes so far as to identify John as the second preacher in the Church of Anastasis. If it is the case that John preached at this church in Jerusalem, then it may have been the venue for the writing of his liturgical poetry and homilies from which he is well known. Under the year 743, Theophilus writes that John delivered a sermon in praise of Peter of Mayuma, who was melted from blaspheming Muhammad. It is, it is the second time of the, it is the second time that Theophanes refers to John as Chrysoros, which means golden flowing, golden flowing, and praises him because the brilliant gaze of the spirit gleams golden in him, both in his words and in his life. Indeed, John is probably best known for his witness with writings which fell into the three categories theological exposition and defense of the Orthodox faith, sermon and homilies, and liturgy, poetry, and hymnody. His work in theology, the video Orthodoxa, for example, was considered a type of summa theologica and has been and has become a standard for the Eastern Orthodox Church. He was also oh, she was also one of the greatest liturgical poets and some of his hymns are, are still used today and his poetry still graces the pages of, of Orthodox liturgy. Writings on iconoclasm The works that he was best known for in his lifetime were the, were the three treatise against the iconoclastic emperor, iconoclastic emperor Leo III. This, this verse was written solely after Leo's first condemnation on icon in 726, uh, and, the other two, and the other two were written around 730 
waar Leo de Postkerkmanos, de patriarch of Constantinopel, groep posim, living under Arab rule and outside the realm of the emperor, John had, John had more freedom to be born in his anathema against Leo. The clear logic and force of John's arguments become widely known throughout the, the, the Eastern world and even today are considered as a complete defense of the veneration of sacred images image based on scripture, tradition and reason that it would be hard to add anything to it. This voice from the unreachable Saracen lands angered the iconoclast emperors to such a degree that in 750-44 at the Iconoclastic Council held in Hyria and near Constantinople, John received the anathemas against him, while Remanos, the former party of Constantinople and George of Kyprus only received one each. It revealed that Leo's son, Constantine the Fifth, Copro Copronimus 741-75, revered to to John by his Arabic name, and in one of the anathemas he not only changed the name Mansur to Manser, so that in its Hebrew form it became a vulgar term, but he, he also condemned him for having Saracen sentiments. He was also an anathematist for being a worshipper of images and writer of falsehood, as well as being an insulter of Christ and traitor to the empire. Then, the words the Trinity has brought them down all the three, bring finality to the series of anathemas. Fortunately for John, the, the iconoclasts lost their support and in the Second Council of Nicaea, the Seventh Ecumenical Council of 787, John was exonerated and restored. And, and rest on. It is interesting to note that the Council used a parallel construction in its rehabilitation of John, so instead of the phrase the Trinity had deposed the tree, he trias two trees Catiline, Cat they used the phrase the Trinity had glorified the tree, he trias two trees Edoxaten, Edoxazen, for the time, to today, his writing have influenced many people, and his hymns and liturgical poems are still used throughout the Eastern Orthodox world. Simply a priest and monk. As Robert Hyland concludes conclude his, his summary of John's life, he raised the question about the scarcity of vectoral information. He uses that it may be a it may be as Theophanes says, and that John was simply a priest and monk, a reclusive man who, however, reached out far with his pen. Hopefully, the material presented above reveals a more extensive historical view of this reclusive man as well as the changing world that he experienced. As we turn to the remarkable apocryphal story of John, we should note that the basis of the story is often built around some of the historical details that we outlined above. There may be an exaggeration of the events, but as is often the case with legends, there is a skeleton of fact beneath the flesh of embellishment which may help give us a more complete picture of John's life. Traditional Biographical Information on John The Rig Vita of St. John Damascus is attributed to John of Jerusalem, either John the Sixth, John the Seventh, or John the Eighth. Lord Favor the latter because John Lord Favor the latter because an 11th century Arabic Vita discovered recently John the Patriarch of the John the Patriarch Vita was apparently a Greek translation from an early, earlier Arabic word do, do thought to have been written by Michael, by Michael, a monk and priest who lived in Antioch and escaped the sentence of slavery when the Seljuk Sultan Sulaiman ibn Kultumis forced the city to surrender. This was on Wednesday, December 4, 1084, the first day of St. John of Damascus. In his gratitude, 
Michael committed himself to find out all that he could about he could about John when he was told that there were no biographies either in Greek or Arabic. Michael took it upon himself to write one. Apparently, there were few authentic sources that he could locate, so he ended up putting two putting together stories, legends, and scraps of information for contemporary fathers. Daniel Sahas, however, favors John the the seventh, and bases his conclusion on the existence on an earlier Arabic Vida, possibly from uh, from as early as 808. Sahas also explains that the Michael story is of is from a codex dated only from. 1646, and based on other information, he concludes that the rest of Vita ascribed to Michael is actually from an earlier Arabic work written before the 10th century. For instance, due, due to the mention of the of Vita of Saint Stephen written in 108, Shah states that the terminus post crime of the Arabic Vita should be, be this date. He also brings to like and to like that an early Arab, early Greek palimpsest codex pushes the date before the 10th century. He then favors John the Seventh over the earlier John the Sixth as the party who translated the earlier Arabic text, and therefore gives his terminus ante on 969. If this the case. Then there is possibly only 60 years between the earliest Vita 108 and John's death 749, which would be which would give give us a stronger connection with actual events that transpired in his life. Robert Highland, however, cautions that the Vita can only be used in a limited sense since the information that would help us to form a proper assessment of his writings in either lacking or, or of doubtful veracity. Frederick Chase also notes that there are a number of problems which, with this sort, biography, which he complains is bombast and poorly written, and is, he feels, also, also quite reliable. What we can learn from, with, from the Vita following is a summary of the major events outlined in the Vita according to the Greek translation. Following that summary is a more detailed assessment of the Vita and its possible use in reconstructing a more accurate biography of John of Damascus. Part 1 John's Prominence in Arab Government The Vita states that John came from a prominent Christian family. The Vita also relates that the story of a monk called Calabria or Sicily named Cosmas, who had been captured and enslaved by the Arabs, and who was freed by John's father and became John's tutor, as well as the tutor of another ad adopted son named Cosmas. After Cosmas had taught John all he knows, he asked permission to retire to the monastery of Saint Sebas. To resume, his, to, resu to resume his monastic life and permission is granted. After John's father dies, dies John is, the, is made the first consular of Porto Simbros, under the caliph, perhaps Abd al-Malik. 685 to 105 Part 2 The Controversy over Icons and His Miraculous Healing in 726, the Byzantine Emperor Leo III banned the use of icons and John wrote three treaties against the, this mandate from the safety of Arab heartlands. 726-30 enriched and yet powerless to harm John directly, the Emperor sends false letters that implicate John in a treasonous plot against the Caliph. The Caliph orders John, the Caliph orders John's right hand amputated after as a punishment of his disloyalty and has the and has the hand put on public display. John begs to have his hand returned to him so that he can bury it, and the Caliph relents. Miraculously, 
After John's pray to the mother of God, his son is restored to as he sleeps. The next day, the caliph sees John with his restored hand, certain marks and all, and a, and all is, and is, and a sentence that John must be innocent of the charge and over him as a prom him a promotion. John has had enough a government work, however, and retires to the monastery of St. St. Sabas located near Jerusalem. Before he can do this, however, he must defend himself in a duel. John gives away his wealth, thirst, and the whole those at the holy places around Jerusalem and set us into the monastery of Saint Sabas with his adopted brothers, with his adopted brother Cosmas. Part three: His early struggle in the monastery of Saint Sabas. John swam preceded besides pre, precedes him, and as he enters the monastery of Saint Sabas, there is no one who feels qualified to undertake his training. Finally. One of the olders of the older strict monks takes it upon himself to receive John's to receive John into his cell and train the young theologian. This is difficult for John because the older monk forbids him to write and sets about the, about trying to ease John's humility by sending him back to the city of Damascus, where he was well known. To sell baskets for a forbidden amount, this tax, this tax, however, turns out to be in John's favor. For instead of being ridiculed, ridiculed one of his former servants has pity on him and paid a high price for the baskets. In time, in time, one of his fellow, one of his fellow monks comes to him and begs him to write some funeral poetry for a relative who has just died. After some persuasion, John relents and writes a poem for his bereaved hand friend. When the older monk hears about this, he turns John out of his cell in anger. The other monks finally persuade the elder monk to relent and take John back in and in time he agrees upon the condition that John would clean out, clean out the latrines in the monastery with his bare hands. John cheerfully accepts this humiliating task. Shortly after this, the Virgin Mary supposedly appears to the older monk one night and tells him that John will one day play a significant part in the, in the destiny of the church and that he should be allowed to write. Thankfully, the ban is lifted and John is allowed to spend his days in writing and in time great treatises and on theology as well as beautiful poetry flow from his pen. The Truth Beyond the Mirror and Glut also, rec also recognizes the shortcomings of the Vita, but he concedes that even if the Greek Vita is worthless as a historical source for the life of John, it is not without interest. What he means by this statement is that even if only a, as a mirror to reflect what future generations recall of John's life, it may not be strictly historical, but it may nonetheless be informative. For example, there is the question as to how John gained his profound education. The Calabrian monk offers a possible explanation, though, as Luth points out, John could have been an astute student in a time when Hellenistic learning was still flourishing in the Middle East in the 7th century. In regard to the Emperor Leo's revenge, the story of the first letter and the, re and the miraculously restored hand illustrates not only how Leo could have responded, but raises John's status in the eyes of his letter follows. Also is the particular icon of the Mother of God with the three hands called Theotokos Tichegusis, which may have come from this story of perhaps inspired the story. Also, 
Lutz explains that the story of his struggles at the monastery could have been a reflection of the false beliefs of some people that monks have been opposed to the to liturgical hymns and singing. Finally, John's ex an exoneration and permission to write, indeed, even a supernatural authentication of John's gift could be a reflection of the author's recognition of John's renown of liturgical poetry. So, if we allow the reader to become an open window to the do, to we to which we can view the historical landscape of John's life, what kind of information do we find reflected here? The high quality of his education. First of all, we can learn some things about John's educational development from this vita. According to this to the biography, John's father desired a good education from, for his son, and upon hearing a newly enslaved monk from, from Calibria in Sicily named Cosmas, he asked the Caliph who would have been Abdelmalik from his release facing possible death. Cosmas' greater distress was that he would have one one to pass on the high grade knowledge that he had acquired during his life. Because John's father and the Caliph were on friendly terms, the monk was released to the man Sukhs and became John's, to, John's tutor. Supposedly, there's another cosmos who is said to, to be John's adopted brother, and the two of them benefited greatly from the teaching of the monk. After teaching John all he knew about of Greek philosophy, Greek philosophy, science, mathematics, and theology. Cosmos asked to be released so he could go back to the monastic life. Of course, this was granted to him. In the story, the miracle refers that John had developed a keen knowledge in a number of fields, such as philosophy, science, and theology, and the fruit of his education was well known centuries later and manifest through his writings. The Sicilian teacher Cosmas may never ha may never have existed, but the story still illustrates the phenomenal intellectual talents of John, and it also provides an explanation of, of, of John's great theological understanding. For a monk will be able to give him a love of theology that would not necessarily be present in a classical education. The Vita also claims that after John's father died. John was invited by the Caliph to become his first consular officer. John may not have attained that level of responsibility in, in the Caliph's court, but even the acts of the Seven Ecumenical Council of 787 recognizes, recognize that John held an important financial post in the Caliphate government, probably the same as his father and grandfather before him. The Vita continues on with a story of how John was framed for treason by Leo III, against whom John had written his anti-iconoclastic anti -iconoc treatise, and the Caliph, and the Caliph ordered John's right hand to be cut off. After the hand was miraculously restored by the Virgin Mary during the night, the Caliph then proclaimed John's innocent. John had had enough of politics, however, and resigned his post in order to retreat the monastery. Certainly much of this part of the Vita can be put aside as, as legend, especially the miraculous restoration of his several hands. But often a scene hagiography can reflect reality. In John's case, for example, his anti-iconostastic writings against against Leo the Third recognized for the sound arguments in his day as well as for generations afterward. The story of his early days in the monastery of Saint Sebas also provides a mirror into John's life. According to the Vida, monastic life in the beginning was easy for John, for apparently because of his great learning, there were no older monks who wanted to, to supervise his training. Finally, one of the elders or spiritual fathers relented but gave John a course of strict dis discipline which did not allow for writing on the study of secular subjects.
in time. Lo, after John's, after John had demonstrated his humili humility, and after some of the other monks who had witnessed John's gift of writing, encouraged his mentor to allow John to, to write liturgical poetry, the old monk finally gave his approval and John's pen began to flow with liturgical songs as well as with sermons and theological treatises. While it is difficult to validate that John was abused by an older monk and restricted from writing when he first entered by the to the monastery and the story does help uh, help us fill in some other details about when John may have left Damascus for the monastic life and where he may have may have actually resided. As we have discussed above in the Marvel section, there is good reason to believe that John resigned for his governmental position around the year 715 when Umar II became the new caliph and began to impose strict regulations on who would be able to serve in administrative posts. John may have traveled the monastery outside of Jerusalem at time, however, Theophanes places John in in Damascus around the year 730 and brought in writing his defense on, icon, on I, of icons against the iconoclast. Then, when we put this together with an 8th century inscription referring to Peter, the patriarch of Damascus who died in 743 as John's bishop, we may be able to see how the video demonstrates that John may have become a monk while still in Damascus and after he left public office. It also, assumed, it also assumes a later entry into Saint Sabbath, perhaps after the publication of his three letters against the iconoclast. This would explain the monk's difficulty in, in, finding, in finding an appropriate mentor for one of such fame. It would also explain the older monk's perception that there was a need for John, for John to learn humility. Likewise, it would provide a backdrop for the drama and intrigue under the Leo, under Leo the Thought. If John were still in Damascus, where the letters being circulated, then his friends may have suggested that he retire to a more remote monastery out of the reach of Leo and the Arab government. The monastery, the monastery at Saint Sabas would be an ideal location for that strategic retreat. Other, ex other events would then fall into place. For example, we know that John was ordained as a priest by John the Party of Jerusalem before he stayed in 735. So, if John of Damascus entered about, entered about Enter around 730 as a monk from another monastery, his ordination in the remaining years of the Patria would not pose a problem. There is also reference to John's friendship with John the Patria in one of his works that gives us a rare glimpse into his personal world. We may not we may not be able to put together a complete year by year biography of John, but together with the better substantiated facts and the glimpses from the Vida, we at least have more than a mere reflection in a distant mirror of historical events. And when, he, and when we take a look at his writings, we will also have a glimpse into his very soul. Conclusion The biographical material on John of, on John of Damascus may be minimal, but through the substantiated histor historical evidence, Together with the logical conclusions based on internal and external evidence on right of writings during that time, as well as the hagiographical information of, on John's life, education, and accomplishments, it can be established that John was employed in a key position as chief financial officer in the Umay Empire, served as a priest and monk in the Merkit tradition and was responsible for writing at least two treatises on Islam as well as significant doctrinal and liturgical works for the Church. In the following chapters, an overview of the historical and theological development of Islam in its first than 100 years will be filtered through the writings of John of Damascus in order to see what can be learned from the pen of this simple 
pues en Monk.